if you would, please open your Bibles back to 1 Thessalonians. Back to the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you've not been with us, we've been in a consecutive exposition and study of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians. It's been a great time and a great study. As many of you know, we just left a wonderful section regarding our call for purity. And now we're going to enter into a section on love. Love in the body of Christ. What does it look like to have a loving church? The late R.C. Sproul said this simple line, but it's good to consider as we think about love and Christianity. He said, a Christian life without love is an exercise in futility. That's right. Christianity is to be defined by love. To call yourself a Christian, but to not be defined by and have your battle cry be love is to have an exercise in futility. It's pointless. Because to call ourselves a Christian is to call ourselves people who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the most loving individual that ever set foot on this earth, as we just sang about. It was our Lord who told his disciples, you remember, in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. And love is a serious topic to the Lord Jesus. You remember in Revelation 2, the Lord Jesus takes an audit of the churches in chapters 2 and 3, and he visits Ephesus, and he walks among the church in Ephesus. And he's extremely encouraged by the church in Ephesus, but he's also very offended by one thing. They left the love that characterized them at first. In fact, not being loving in a church is so serious to the Lord Jesus, he told that church, if you do not repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. You'll no longer be a church. We live in a culture that's not about biblical love. In fact, we live in a culture that wants to redefine love, don't we? Love is tolerance. Love is excusing sin. Love is not speaking the truth to people. Love is whatever you want to define love to be. In fact, I read articles this week about how we should all be on a quest for self-love. Study after study exhorting us on our great need to love ourselves more. I chuckled this week and thought, no one has to teach me that. That's intuitive to my old nature, to love myself. In fact, biblical love comes with a different message. Biblical love calls to liberate us from self-love because self-love's easy for us. That's all we did before Christ was love self. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all so that they who live, listen to this, might no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. We were saved, if you're a believer, to stop loving self and start living a life committed to biblical love. But then we have other problems with love. Love gets defined all the time in ways different than the scriptures. In fact, love is one of those words that Satan has really got his hooks into, hasn't he? In fact, you say the word love and there's all different types of definitions, all different types of ways people want to define love. Sure, love is a feeling. We experience feelings of love. But sometimes it's left there and we miss the idea that love is actually an act of the will. It's volitional. It's a choice that we make by faith. Love is, as we just sang about, what our Savior was when he condescended to come down and die for us. He was a picture of perfect love. It was love that compelled the Father to send the Son. For God so loved the world, he sent his Son. And today in our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at a church that's extremely loving. A faithful church who's living a very healthy life vibrant way in the way they love one another. And yet again, just like our last few weeks, just because they're living in love, Paul's going to tell them again, you need to excel more in your love. So let's read this passage together. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. And as I read it, I just would like to say to us as we consider this text this morning, 
Dear Cornerstone, this is an exhortation to us of what faithful love looks like and why we need to keep growing in it. Because at the center of true Christian fellowship is going to be biblical love. So look at verse 9. We'll read to verse 12. Now as to the love of the brethren. You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice love toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, even though that's all true, excel still more. And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Now, when you come to this passage at first glance, when you look at it, you may think that verses 9 and 10 are about love and verses 11 and 12 are about work. And yet, if you were just looking at the original text and the the, the grammar in the Greek, what you would find is everything said in 11 and 12 is modifying and supporting all that's being said in 9 and 10. What does that mean? 9 and 10 is all about love and everything said in 11 and 12 and how we work is also about love. In fact, this is one of those passages where the biblical authors are going to take different spheres of our life. We have a sphere as a citizen or as a worker or as an employee And that's going to merge with our life in the church. And what binds our life and work and our life in church together is going to be one thing, love. In fact, we're going to see here in a little bit this morning that how you conduct yourself in the workplace is a good indication of whether you love your church or not. And how you conduct yourself in the workplace is going to be a good indication of whether you love lost souls. And we're going to look at how you love not only people in this church, but all the brethren is an indication of what is your threshold for love? Is there limits to your love? Is there boundaries to your love? This passage is all about biblical love. So if you're taking notes, this is a passage to the church about the corporate nature of love in the body of Christ. It's found in verses 9 to 12, and this will be our notes, and we'll go through all these points this morning. It'll be four features of love in a faithful church. Four features of love in a faithful church. I'll give them to you up front and I'll walk back through them. Love in a faithful church is supernatural. That means it doesn't come with the old man. Once you get saved, you finally learn to love. We're gonna see it's unrestricted. That is to say, if you really love people like Christ, there'll be no limits to your love and no boundaries to your love. There'll be no way that you throttle back love based on the person that is receiving it. It's unrestricted. That's in verse 10. We'll also see it's an increasing love. It's an excel still more love. We'll be exhorted to love more than we already do. Isn't that interesting that even though this church is healthy, Paul doesn't say, okay, relax, just wait for the rapture. He says, no, get busy growing in the areas I'm exhorting you to grow. And fourth, we're going to see it's a purposeful love. It's a purposeful love. And those purposes are going to be how you work is going to show how much you love your church and how you work is going to show how much you love souls. Your purposed love is for your church and for lost souls. So we'll cover all that today. Four features of love in a faithful church. Let's consider the first. Love in a faithful church is a supernatural love. It's a supernatural love. That is to say, this is something the Spirit must produce. Look at verse 9. Now, he says, as to the love of the brethren, that's all believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. It's interesting about verse 9 is we have two different words for love used. In the beginning of verse 9, you have the word phileo, which is family love. And at the end of verse 9, you have the word agape, which is more describing a sacrificial Christ-like love, giving of yourself love. So let's think about the first word for a second, this phileo love. In fact, you've probably heard this because the city Philadelphia got their name from phileo. They're called the city of brotherly love. I've been there and they weren't that nice when I was there. 
but apparently they're supposed to be the city of brotherly love. I felt like everyone yelled at me. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's where they get their name. Phileo is an important word for us to consider this morning if you're a Christian, because it's a love that comes with the new birth. That is to say, we are born into our earthly families. You're born into your family with blood sisters and brothers. You have siblings in your earthly family in your first birth. And you love them and you care for them and their family. Phileo love in the Christian community is the love that comes with your second birth, your rebirth, when you're born into your spiritual family. You see, in regeneration, when God saves a sinner and gives them a second birth, they now get a new family. You go from the family of Satan, John 8, where you're a slave to your sin and your father's the devil, to now your father being God and you're born into his family. And guess what we do now that we have a new father? We now love our brothers and sisters in Christ, phileo. We have a love for our spiritual siblings that we didn't previously have. You see, when God saves someone through the blood of his son and purchases them at the cross, he unites with them in his son, Jesus Christ, a love for their spiritual family. New father, new siblings with my second birth. We might say it this way. If a person says they've been born again, and they've had a second birth where they've come to put their faith in Christ and their hearts been changed and their nature's been um, taken from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And they've went from wickedness and corruption to righteousness and holiness and striving to live for the Lord. They've been changed with new affections and yet they don't love other brothers and sisters in Christ. They should wonder if they've ever been born again. Because what he is about to say is when God saves you and brings you into the spiritual family, he installs in you something foreign to your old nature, a love for his other children. I mean, you know this, right? You and I could have our, our, our um, biological family that we spend time around, that we love our brothers and sisters, but then we get saved and we get born again and brought into the spiritual family, and we could meet a believer. And in an hour with that one believer, I could be closer and feel more unity to them than I do my earthly family if they're lost. Why is that? God puts that in the heart when he saves us. This is why he says that strange line that you're wondering why he says that. Look at the text. You have no need for anyone to write you about love. What do you mean we have no need for anyone to write us about love? Paul, you're writing us a letter right now. What do you mean I don't need anything written to me? Look at what the text says. There's a reason he says that. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He's not saying you don't need instruction on love. He's saying you don't need anybody to tell you that you need to love other Christians. When God saved you, he put that in you and that will be natural to you. In fact, the verb tense is present active indicative, which just is a a, a way of describing this is an ongoing work that God has produced in you where you're always going to be inclined and leaning towards loving other Christians. The way he describes this is got to be one of the coolest ways in the New Testament because he makes up a word. It's the only time this word shows up in your New Testament. Look back in your text there. He says, we don't need to write to you about love. That is to say that you need to love other Christians, phileo. Why? You yourselves are taught by God to love. This is really interesting. So the word to teach in the Greek didaskalos or didaskalon, to take to take content and put it in the mind, to teach. That's the word here. Paul just takes the word God, theos, and just sticks them together. God taught. (laughs) The reason we don't have to tell you you need to love other believers is because God taught it to you. And what is he saying? The internal testimony of your conversion is God did something in the heart that only he can do. He taught your heart to love other children. He taught your heart to love his people. He taught your heart and awakened it so it would love his kids, people in the church. You've been God taught, taught by God, notice, to love. Not only phileo love, this family love, but agape love. Look back in the text. You were taught by God 
not only to love them as your family, but to want to sacrifice and meet needs and spend yourself for other believers. Why? God did that work in your heart. A supernatural internal transformation where God teaches the heart to love other Christians. First Peter says the same thing, a little bit different language, but it says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable seed, the living and abiding word of God. And when God did that, he teaches you to phileo, to love other believers. We might have the question when you think about this, well, sometimes I'm not mature in my love. Sometimes I, when I got received Christ and I was saved and the Lord changed my heart. I didn't know anything about the church. I didn't know anything about the one another's. I didn't know really anything what I was supposed to do. He's not saying you're going to be mature in your love. He's about to tell us to excel more and grow in your love. He's saying as a baseline from the root system, God did something that birthed something in your heart that wasn't there before, a love for other Christians. If you want to, uh, go back and try and think about, sometimes we ask the question, when did God save me? When was that supernatural rebirth done? When did God from heaven declare me righteous and innocent? Maybe some people say, I heard the gospel my whole life. I heard it for many, many years, but I don't know when I got saved. Well, there's a lot of ways you can go back and consider when you got saved, but I know one of them for certain. When did there become in you this this new zealous, urgent desire to fellowship and become fond of other believers? When did you want to spend time with the people of God? When did you want to serve the people of God? When did you want to be with other Christians and minister to them and have them minister to you? When was it no longer okay for you to be apart from other believers? When did that happen? Because that's rebirth. That's when God teaches your heart to love. We might say this just in summary as we're getting on the launch ramp of this passage. If you're here today and you love other Christians, you long for other Christians, you desire Sundays because you just want to be with other believers. In the week, you're just looking for outlets to talk to other Christians. You love fellowship with them and encouragement from them. And when you see some believers after being in the world, you're like, ah, so good to see you. It was a hard week and it's terrible out there, but it's good to see you because I love the brethren. If that's in your heart, you can be encouraged that your heart's been taught by God to love. That's the sign of a supernatural work of the third person of the Trinity taking up residency in your heart and saving you. That's the first feature of love in a healthy church. It's supernatural. No one has to tell a true believer, you need to love other believers. It comes with conversion. You want to love the brethren. It's supernatural. Second feature, spend some more time on this one. The second feature of love in a healthy church is not only that it's supernatural, but I've just put the word, it's unrestricted. It's unrestricted. Meaning a healthy church's love is not selective. You don't love some people and not love other people. You don't love people in your group or your clique, but you don't love other people. You don't love older people because you're older, but you neglect the younger people. You're not a young person that says, I don't need the older generation. I'm only going to hang out with young people. You don't just love those who are easy for you. Biblical love, listen, it has no boundaries. It has no parameters. It is not contained by certain context or geography or hindered by our preferences. Anytime we put some parameter or boundary or preference or or, uh, our own love for comfort in the topic of love, we go from biblical love to self-love. Do you know how we know that biblical love, agape love that's even on display here should not have boundaries, should not have parameters? Not only we're gonna see it in the text in verse 10, But would you have a savior if Jesus put boundaries and parameters on the way he loved you? I mean, let's just consider it for a second. You hated him. You may have said you thought well of him, but if you weren't a believer, you hated him theologically. You were his enemy, Romans 5, Daniel read it earlier. You were a child of the evil one, a child of wrath, rejecting him, 
Romans 1, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, slapping his hand away, any offer of mercy and grace in your hardness and rejection of him. You would have crucified him had you have been there and had the opportunity. If you don't believe that, you don't understand your sin. You would have happily went to hell rejecting him because he wasn't worthy of you. That's a theological perspective of man. And yet Jesus, while we were helpless, Romans 5, while we were enemies, while we were God rejectors, at the right time, he decided to move towards us in his merciful love and love us with no boundaries, no parameters, no restrictions, nothing stopped him. In fact, he loved us while we opposed him to die for his enemies. And on the cross, even some of those people standing there, he prayed for the very people that were crucifying him. So biblical love, if it's defined by Christ, if it has anything that hinders your love, any boundary parameter, any way you're selective, it's self-love, not Christ-like love. And this church was known in its reputation for not having any different way they loved every single believer. Look at the text, verse 10. For giving the reason we know they're so loving, Indeed, you do practice it, verse 10. That is, you do practice love. Notice, love toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. So it's not just the Thessalonian church is the frozen chosen and they just sit around and love each other. All of Macedonia, the whole Macedonian region, they loved the brethren. It's interesting, you think about the Macedonian region start to consider it a little bit. You got Thessalonica there so that we know we loved the brethren in their church, but you've also got Philippi, you've got Berea, and you've got a number of other places where churches were planted and established, where Paul went and visited. This church was known not only for loving in their local assembly, but brethren there is all the believers at other churches. When they had an opportunity to love them, they showed sacrificial love and service for them as well. You say, well, how does, what does that look like? Well, we have to remember, Thessalonica was one of the main port towns that, that allowed travel and trade through the entire Roman Empire. So all of these other churches and believers at those churches that were in the trade industry would have come through town and come through Thessalonica and would have needed places to stay. They would have needed food. They would have needed meals. They would have needed encouragement. They might've showed up on one Lord's day on a Sunday to be encouraged because they were away from their home church in Berea or their home church up in the Galatian region. This church's reputation was when people walked into this church, when the brethren came, the love the brethren got, even when they didn't know them was the same they showed to the people they were familiar with and they knew. They also would have had transplants. This was a thriving community with lots of opportunity for work and trade and commerce. So people would have come in and moved there and needed help uh, assimilating into church life. They showed love to them, kindness, sacrifice, service. Notice it says they practiced love. That is a word for action. It was the habit of their life. Now, the word that's not here, but it's describing, I think most, most notably is the word hospitality. Hospitality is the word we see all through the New Testament that talks about love for people you're unfamiliar with. Sometimes we translate the compound word love of strangers. It's a love for people you don't know well. It's the idea of meeting someone and if they're one of the brethren, it doesn't impact or hinder or stop your love. Even if you don't know them well, you show them the same kind of love, the same kind of sacrifice, the same kind of service. We might say it this way, a person you've known 10 years that's a believer or a person you've known 10 seconds, your love is not going to be hindered or throttled back anymore for the person you've known 10 seconds versus 10 years. If they're the brethren, you wanna love and serve them because they belong to the same father in the same spiritual family. This church was known for loving, serving, supporting all faithful local churches that they knew about. Now, it's a little bit different than today because we probably have as many churches five minutes from here that were within 100 miles of Northern Greece, which is Macedonia. So it, it's not the same in that when you have persecution going on in, during this time in the church, and Satan hasn't had enough time to corral a bunch of people to raise up a bunch of counterfeit churches, 
there's not as many so-called brethren around, it would have been a bit more clear who the brethren were. And so they would have known coming from faithful churches, these were faithful brethren and they would have looked to serve them. So the tacit passage is not saying every single church you know that professes Christ, they're the brethren, you need to love them that way. No, they, they would have been doing what every faithful New Testament church was doing, taking an audit on their doctrine, making sure they weren't false teachers, making sure they were legitimate brethren. There would have been a, 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 a love for them, but a realization that Satan's always trying to destroy the church. But nevertheless, the heart posture that's in view here is an open-hearted, open-home acceptance of every true brethren and believer. And they were notorious for it. It was their reputation. To go into Thessalonica for a day or a year was to know the love of Christ, the truth of Christ, the care of Christ that came through this church. So we could say this, either worldwide or down the street, Cornerstone Bible Church, like Thessalonica, should be notoriously known for open-hearted, open-homed fellowship, love, encouragement, the love of Christ, speaking truth, sharing truth, coming alongside and meeting needs. It should not matter how long we've known someone or where they're from or what their background is. If we're going to love them like Christ, it is an unrestricted love. If I could make a note about this, something I've I've observed over time. It's just a tendency. It's not biblical love. It's self-love. The text does not say they opened up their heart and their home and they loved those in all Macedonia if they knew those people were going to be around a long time or they thought it was a good investment for them. The text doesn't say Well, I'll pour into them if I think I'm going to be there for a while or they're going to be around for a while. Then I will love and serve them. But until I know the long-term benefit of this relationship, I'm going to hold back some of my love. Until I know how much this relationship benefits me, then I'll start loving them. Do you realize that's self-love? That is driven by a motive to preserve and protect self. Or I've heard people say, I'm only going to be here a little while, so it's hard to open up. Or they're going to be here a little while, so it's hard to open up. Biblical love that's like Christ is unrestricted. It does not matter if the relationship has a potential to benefit you. It literally doesn't matter. Christ-like love serves needing no reciprocation, needing no fame, no notoriety, no praise, just an opportunity to be like the Savior is enough. We just love. Why do we do that? 1 John 4, 19. Because he first loved us. Do you ever notice that about Jesus? When I think about this text, I was thinking about a church that's just known for whenever there was an opportunity to show sacrificial love and kindness, they did it. I thought about Jesus' ministry and I thought about him in the gospels when the children came. And his disciples are like, come on, we're in a hurry. We got to get stuff. We got stuff to get done. We got stuff that needs to be accomplished for the kingdom. And he told his disciples, guys, Let the little children come. This is an opportunity to love them in the moment and I want to love them and show them love in this moment. Unrestricted love. The world loves when it will benefit them. The world loves when it's good for them. The world assesses the value of a relationship and then decides how much sacrificial love they want to show. Christ never did any of that to any of us or we wouldn't be saved. This church was known for love of the brethren. I hope when people come through here, if they're here for a weekend or a conference or a day or an hour or one Sunday, they could say, that church looked to show me the love of Christ. Speaking the truth to me, coming alongside me, encouraging me, meeting needs, it did not matter. And you know, this type of love in this church is what makes for a healthy, unified church because biblical love driving church life biblical unity and love driving church life where we're just all about being what Christ is about, souls, his kingdom, ministering to people, that type of love and that commitment to be like Christ, you know what that produces in the center of the people of God? A real unity. Because we love the same Bible, love the same God, love the same Christ, have the same passion for the same souls, and all we want to do is be like him. That is what makes unity. This is why when you think about some of the um, toxic ways we're being told 
love is supposed to come about today, it's actually deforming the biblical concept of love and unity because they're a package together. For example, we have this idea that if you're going to really be a loving church and create unity, then we need to embrace this CRT. We need to embrace this woke stuff. We need to bring all these ideas in that the most important thing that we identify in one another is the differences in our ethnicity and there's diversity there. And we need to make that the highest thing we identify in church life and that will be a loving church. Love and unity in the church comes by the blood of Christ, beloved. Taught by God internally when he loves us. We don't ignore ethnicity, but our love transcends ethnicity and the amount of melanin one has in their skin. And our love of the brethren and all brethren is bought through the lamb, united by the blood and love in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That creates a real loving community. Anything less than that is cheapening love or is counterfeit love. This church didn't focus on any of that silly stuff. It was just all about, are they believers? Are they the church? How do we love them? That's what makes unity, real love, biblical love in the church. So that's two features of love. It's supernatural and it's unrestricted. Third, third feature of love in this church. Not only is it supernatural, not only is it unrestricted, but it's increasing. Look at verse 10. It's increasing. For indeed you practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Sometimes when I read Paul this way, I feel like it's one of my old college coaches and we're on a winning streak. Coach, we've won 10 of the last 10 games. Yes, but I want you to win 10 more. Paul, you just said we're a loving church. We're a faithful church. We're an excelling church. We're a growing church. We're loving all of the believers and all of the churches. And then you want us to slow down and ask how we can love more? And Paul said, yes, of course I do. Because until we're like Jesus Christ, we've never loved enough. Does that mean we sit back and pout and pity that we're not loving enough? Of course not. We rejoice when there's moments of love. We see sacrifice and service and kindness and generosity and people discipling one another and encouraging one another. And we see people opening up their hearts and homes to strangers and we rejoice and say, wow, that's love. But then we don't congratulate ourselves and say, yeah, we've arrived as a church. We got this. We are the loving church. No, then we become Ephesus and we lose love. He says to them, look at it. I want you in your love to excel still more. Why can he say that? Because Jesus Christ is the perfect picture of love who died a brutal, cruel death on our behalf as the ultimate act of love on Calvary's tree. We will never love as much as Jesus. So there's always more we can do. I, I don't think I'd meet anybody after church and said, if I said to you, you know, do you feel like you really arrived in biblical love? You're meeting every need you can meet. Your heart's open to sacrifice every chance you get. You never have self-love or self-interest or self-awareness. You're never really about you and your things and your accomplishments and your wants. You're just totally committed to the glory of God and the good of souls 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't think anybody's gonna say that to me. This is why we need a savior because we're not like that. But I would bring before us today this truth, if he's calling this healthy, faithful, loving, kind church to excel still more, I would ask you, Cornerstone, what I asked myself this week, where can you excel still more? Where is your love not what it should be? Where does self-love replace biblical love? Where do you hold back love to self-protect? Where do you not move in and meet a need when you know that you could because selfishness gets in the way? Or where are you going to the point where it would cost you, but you're holding back because you just don't want to lay it all on the line to show sacrifice and kindness and love? You say, Pastor, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know where I should love more. Well, Love is defined by Christ, so we need to know what love is. It's to sacrifice and meet needs of others. It's to come alongside and support and encourage people when they have something that we could benefit them in. 
It's to spend ourselves for others' good with resources, with time, with truth. It's to speak truth. It's to disciple, to encourage. It's to open up our life and share burdens. It's to pray for one another. It's to come alongside one another in sin. It's to spend long hours when people are hurting. It's love. You just give yourself. You say, Pastor, I don't even know how to do that. I don't know if I've ever had relationships like that. Well, let's think through that for a second then. To love like this requires a couple things. You need to know needs if you're going to meet them, right? Well, you know needs. You have to spend time with people. I know these are basic things, but if we're going to know needs of other people, then we have to spend time with other people. And when we spend time with other people, we have to be willing to go beyond the typical artificial, how was the ball game? How was your week? How was lunch? How was whatever else we're talking about? And penetrate past that and say, brother, how's your soul? What have you been feeding on this week from the word of God? How's your time in the word? What sins are you battling that you want me to pray for you in? What areas do you need to grow in your marriage and personal holiness? What doctrines of scripture do you need to understand more about the glories of God that I could be an encouragement to you in? Where have you stumbled most recently that I could bring some scripture to you in? How's your parenting? How's your heart? You have to spend time with people and be willing to go beyond the typical surface level artificial stuff that makes up our relationships. These are not healthy relationships. These are relationships about self-love. I'll go as far as I can until I think you could hurt me and then you're done. What if Christ did that to the disciples? The guys fell asleep in the first week of his ministry and they fell asleep in the end of his ministry. He still loved them. If we're going to be about love, we need to know people. We need to spend time with people. That means we need to open up our life to people. We need to open up our heart to people. We need to share burdens with people. We need to come alongside people. And guess what? We need to listen when they talk. Because when people are sharing things, these are things that we need to be listening for. And then we need to pray for them. I mean, how neat would it be? How many relationships have you had where you told someone a prayer request and they came to you a week later and you all do this to me all the time and said, Pastor, I heard your prayer request. I've been praying for you. How are you doing in that area? When's the last time you took a prayer request, prayed for it all week, followed up with the person and said, hey, I've been praying for you since last week. How's that going? To excel still more requires effort. Agape love is to spend yourself at the cost of yourself. If I could just add one more thing, I think I need to do sometimes. I need to deprogram you. And what I mean is deprogram. Sometimes churches today have as many programs as the gym. It's like you can go to your gym and you can go to your church and you have the same amount of program options. And we get conditioned with this idea that love must be getting plugged and played into some program. Look, ministry to people is not about programs. It's about people. Ministry is souls. Ministry is people. I don't know if you know this, but I've read no passage about heaven being full of programs. It's all about souls, sanctification, growth, the gospel, our life, the glory of God, our relationships. If we're going to be a people that show this type of love, then we must view our life as about people, not programs. And people do this. They come to church and they go, I want to serve. What program can I be a part of? And that's fine. We organize events and we do stuff like that. But the purpose of those is to get people together so that people can minister to each other. If you want to serve a church, it's real easy. Find someone that has a need, get to know them, pray for them, come alongside them. You're serving the church. Ministry is about people. This church was about people. It was about souls. It was about the brethren. It was about encouragement. Jesus spent time with his disciples pouring into their inner life. Look, anyone can organize an event. Like I can, I can do a reoccurring event anytime. Love requires moving into people's lives, spending time with them, listening to them, sharing burdens, coming alongside them and building a real friendship around what Ephesians 4 says, builds one another up in love. So if you're gonna excel still more, you're gonna have to ask yourself questions like, how am I gonna carve out time for people? Who am I gonna be praying for? Who are the people I want to get to know better, to have a friendship with so that we can speak the truth to one another in love? And you're going to have to do something else. You're going to to have to confess and repent of habits you've developed 
of shallow ways you've approached people in relationships where I'll only love you until you hurt me and then you're out. Look, we're sinners. Have you read 1 Corinthians 13? Love is in response to being sinned against most of the time. We're gonna have to be okay if we're gonna exercise and excel still more in being sinned against and forgiving in love and, and being kind in love and coming alongside people in love, excel still more. This is a church where its love was increasing. I get really burdened about this, this whole idea of people not having strong friendships and relationships because I think it's so pervasive in our culture. We found ways to hide behind the screen, hide behind the, the, the barriers and the walls that we put up. We found ways to insulate our lives from ever being vulnerable or exposed or talking through hard issues. This is not what God designed you to be as a Christian. He designed you to walk alongside other believers in biblical love. And if both people are committed to love, guess what happens? We treat each other the way Christ treated us. We forgive each other. We're kind to each other. We absorb weaknesses of one another. We are forbearing. This church excelled and they needed to excel more. So I would just say to Cornerstone, Cornerstone, you're a very loving church. We are a very loving church. I'm so encouraged. Love defined biblically, excel still more. Because in a biblical church, love is never static. It's always increasing. So that's three features of love in a healthy church. Now here's the fourth. It's purposeful. It's supernatural. It's unrestricted. It's increasing. And now it's purposeful. Now this gets very poignant in 11 and 12. Very, very interesting because a particular case comes up. And Paul starts to address your love as it relates to your work life. Now, two things were happening in this church that you really need to tune in on or 11 and 12 is not going to make sense to you. So we know from the ongoing of the Thessalonian church and second Thessalonians that there were not a lot of people, but a few people in church life in Thessalonica, particularly men that were lazy. They were grumblers. They would not work hard. They were freeloaders. And what happened is, as I'm going to show you in a second, is either they would go to work and they'd grumble and they'd complain and they'd be difficult and they wouldn't submit to authority or they'd take advantage of people and not have integrity and they'd make no income or they'd get fired from their job. That was one group. They were terrible workers. They were bad in the secular workforce. There was another type of guys that were even more stubborn and they just wouldn't work. They were just insubordinate and proud and stubborn and said, you know what? I'm not going to work. And you know what they did? They didn't just sit back. They actually went to the church and started going to people in the church and saying, I can't hold down a job. I don't have money. I have needs. Will you give me money? This was happening in the church. They were coming and there was a few guys, not a lot, but a few that may even have not been regenerate that were hanging around and they were wanting the church to feed them resources and money where they were unwilling to earn it themselves. And so 11 and 12 starts to discuss that. But before we do, just turn over to 2 Thessalonians for a second and look at chapter three, verses seven to 12, because Paul must have known a little bit about it in the first letter to the Thessalonians. And by the time the second letter came, there must've been a couple of guys that were absolutely unrepentant. And Paul gives some serious instruction to these professing believers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. Notice what it says. And you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so we'd not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so you'd follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, he does not eat. For we hear that some among you are leading undisciplined lives, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies, worried about everybody else's stuff and neglecting their own tasks. Now, such persons we command and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. There was people in the church that wouldn't work. Paul said, don't give them handouts. 
don't help them out. Don't bail them out. You're comforting them in their sin. But clearly they were getting some traction and going around and getting people to support them. So now take that mindset for this is fully blossomed back to 1 Thessalonians and you'll see what he's addressing here. 1 Thessalonians, back to chapter four, verses 11 and 12. The topic of love is continuing, but love has a purpose now. And love has this purpose, he's saying. You need to be a hardworking, disciplined, assertive, aggressive laborer in the workforce, whether you're an owner operator, whether you're an employee and you come under someone and how you work, you need to work in such a way that you don't become a financial burden to the church. You can take care of your own needs. And here's what he's saying. If you really love your local assembly, then you'll do all you can to provide for yourself so you don't shoulder them with the burdens of your finances. Let me make a disclaimer. This is not speaking about people that are unable to work, people that would have had things hindering them from working, disabilities from working, maybe a godly person that lost their job for the sake of the gospel. He's not talking about people that are willing to work but can't find it. Those are legitimate needs the church should help out with. That's all through the scriptures. You see that through Acts. Anyone had need, they helped them. He's talking about people that are able to work, but won't. Those type of freeloaders, he said, you need to mark out those men in 2 Thessalonians. But in 1 Thessalonians, it's as if he's doing a little preventative maintenance and saying, in light of what I'm hearing from Timothy, I'm gonna tell you, if you really love your church, and you don't ever want to be a burden to it, I want you to work in such a way that even secular pagans will appreciate things you do. You say, wait a second. Pagans can appreciate the way I work? Of course they can. There's lots of things in God's common grace that believers and unbelievers appreciate about work. Notice what he says in the text. I want you to make it your ambition, verse 11, to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. We've told you this before. Notice. So that, here's the purpose, you will behave properly towards outsiders. That is speaking of unbelievers. Behave properly is conduct yourself in such a way that it's approving by outsiders. And you may say, well, what are the criteria that even a pagan would appreciate my work? Well, he tells us, this is how a Christian person ought to work. This ought to be your reputation. You ought to be known for this. And he gives this criteria. Look back in the text. The purpose of this, if you look at the end of 12, is you will not carry some need that the church has to support because you're working hard and caring for yourself. Verse 11, notice what he says you need to be known for in your work. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You know what ambition means? It means to be zealous pursuit of doing something worthy and honorable. He says, make it your zealous pursuit to do something worthy and honorable. And that is, lead a quiet life. (laughs) That's interesting. Quiet there doesn't mean you don't speak. It means a submissive life. It means a life under authority. It means a life that even works hard and trusts God when there's things that don't go your way. We are such a loud, smack-talking Uh, verbose, grumbling, discontent workforce. Christians ought to be known for settledness, sincerity, integrity, submission, godliness, carefulness, coming under authority, surrendering themselves quite literally to where God has them. Even an unsaved employer would love an employee who just puts their head down and works hard. Not only a quiet life, but notice, make it your ambition to attend to your own business. Literally, mind your own business. If God puts it in front of you, he wants you to put your hand to it and do it well and stay focused. Do we live in a distracted culture? I mean, this phone makes us think that we're um, omnipresent. We can be everywhere at one time. We're omnipotent. We know all things. And all we have to do is it's, it's at our thumbs right here. I can just go and I know everything and I can be everywhere. We weren't designed for this. Those types of things can distract us from doing this right here. Attend to your business. 
Do what is in front of you and do it well and keep your head down and do it for the glory of God. Do you think a secular uh, workforce loves it when a person just puts their head down and works hard? Yeah. Do you think people that wanna purchase products from you love it when they know you're just in the moment, working hard, being diligent, being faithful at what you've been called to do, minding your own business? I recently heard at a conference someone say, wherever you're at, be all there. That's probably what this means. Be in the moment. And then one more, work with your hands. Ergizomai, to engage with strenuous effort, to exert energy to the point of exhaustion. Christians ought to be known as hard workers by opposite. It should not be ever described that a Christian is lazy or discontent or grumbling or bitter in their workplace. They ought to be known to have a good godly attitude because they know everything that comes to them is coming from God's good unfolding providence and they trust him. This is a person that works hard in what they do. And you know what happens? The reaping and sowing. You make resources, you make money, and you're not a burden to the church. And on top of that, Ephesians 4.28, you can actually benefit the church. You work so you can give to those in need. You make resources so you can give. That's one of the purposes. If you love your church, he's saying to them, you will work hard so you don't become a burden. Now, that doesn't mean sometimes people don't have circumstances where the church needs to help. The hard issue here is someone that's willing but unable. There's a second purpose, though. Not only because you love your church, but because you love souls. Look back in the text. He says, you behave, verse 12, properly towards outsiders. Behaving properly is to have beautiful conduct to have conduct that attracts them to the gospel. If you love your coworkers that are headed for hell, you realize that every person you know is going to heaven or hell. There's only two locations. Under the wrath of God in hell or under the blessing of God in heaven, God's presence will be at both. They will pay for their sin for eternity or they'll be with the Lord Jesus in his presence, uh, enjoying his presence and blessing in heaven. If you love lost people you work with, you will want to behave properly. It's the idea of having distinctly Christian conduct. Romans 13, 13 says this, let us behave properly in the day, not as carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife or jealousy. If you love your lost coworkers, then you want your work life to be distinctly Christian. In this sense, you have a godly attitude. You're not a grumbler. You're not a whiner. You're not a complainer. You're not lazy. You work hard with your hands and you're diligent. This sends a message to people and they'll say, what is it about you that's different? And you can tell them of your Christ. When I was playing baseball and I had retired, I went back to the field after I was done and I met one of the pitching coaches. I'll never forget him. His name was Rosie. And Rosie came up to me and he said, Darren, Darren, I got to talk to you. There's a guy out here that's a pitcher that's hurt, but he has like the best attitude and he's the hardest worker of any guy out here. And nobody has this good of attitude when they're hurt and nobody's working this hard. In fact, he has the best response I've ever seen to an injury. And I found out he's going to your church. What is going on at your church? And what are they teaching over there that that guy has that attitude? I need to know about your church. That's this point here. That guy's godly conduct made that guy wonder, what does he have that I don't? So love in this text has the purpose that you love your church by how you work and you love souls by how you work. Four features of love in a healthy church. It's supernatural. It's unrestricted. It's increasing and it's purposeful. Purposeful for souls and purposeful to love your church. Cornerstone, let's keep excelling still more. Amen.